Now we're taking a look at online content construction. Online content construction is one of the cornerstones of the online research and media skills model. As an initial look at this, we want to focus on the essential question or the essential elements of this cornerstone and specifically this talk. This video, the tweetable summary, basically we're going to look at students encoding and decoding meaning as they construct, redesign, and reinvent online text. As we take a look at online content construction, the focus for me really needs to be on ways that we can empower students as they not only read, but write online informational text. So now, thanks to the use of the internet as a tool, we have an opportunity to push our students to be powerful or at least members of the online community. They can read and they can use online information, but also they can create and think thoughtfully about the way that they construct content. So what we view is we want to move students from being consumers of content to starting to, to curate content. We see this habit occurring now when we look at tools like Pinterest where people will go on and they'll create collections of links and tools and share those out. And then we want to move students into constructing content. So, so move them from being consumers to curators to constructors of content and being able to build and remix digital content. When we think about content construction, there are some very big theoretical perspectives that are integrated into this. Keep in mind that with all of the online research and media skills model, there's research behind this. There is a lot of theory that, that is formulating all this. And the truth of the matter is that we cannot ignore it. So in my mind, as a framed online content construction, we think about multimodal design as being an element. So how students and how individuals can use images and video and text and design aesthetics and, and, and where things are lined up on a page uh, in order to create or convey, a me convey meaning. Uh, this brings in elements of semiotics. Uh, so there is a, a wealth of literature behind this that informs and continues to inform these concepts. Obviously, the work in new literacies informs all of this work. And also cognitive apprenticeship. Uh, this idea of uh, a constructivist or a social constructivist education and, and most importantly having students get gradually gain ownership of the classroom students gradually be able to take over leadership and work with others and share their expertise with other students in the classroom and they are valuable integral parts of the work process and they are elements of what is doing the teaching and learning in the classroom. They teach other students um, and they are basically building knowledge together, co-constructing knowledge with their students. One other important element of cognitive apprenticeship that I don't want to gloss over is the reflective part. Uh, there's a fancy word that we use called abstracted replay, but it's a way for as students are working and when students are completed, Take a look at the work product, but also probably more importantly, the work process and talk about what did they think and what did they do and what could they do better next time they were to make a website or write a blog post. What did they learn and how can they share this out with others? So that's uh, a hugely important part of this, being able to reflect as well as being able to work with others and take over leadership in the classroom. So in terms of online content construction, I view there, there are five skills involved in online content construction. We look at planning, generating, organizing, composing, and ultimately revising this product that we have students working on. The planning stage is one of the, the first pieces. Uh, I wanted to start off and say that you know this is an, an iterative process that this is something that does not have to occur in a vacuum and, and occur in these stages. Students can go in and out of these different stages and skills and they can go through the process again just the same way they would in the writing process. 
a lot of this is framed by and informed by uh, the wealth of writing instruction and writing research that we have throughout the years. But in planning, a lot of times it's helpful for as students create this digital content, they get out pen and paper and draft out representations of what they want to build. So we want students to create internal, so mental models and external representations of this content. So storyboard, write out exactly what they want to build and try and identify why. And is it appropriate for the ultimate task? Or are they just spinning their wheels? And there is, an, a, there is a certain element where we want students to play and spin their wheels, but not when there is a product that needs to be turned in. We also want to next move to generating. Generating is when they take those initial maps, those representations, the internal pieces, the external pieces, those graphic organizers, and the storyboards, and they start to create content. So they start to create videos that will be used. They start to type out the textual pieces. They record the audio podcasts. They find the YouTube clips. This is when they start to translate those internal and external representations into elements of that digital product. So we're using the roadmaps, we're using what we gained during planning, and we're starting to build up the component parts. Then I like to have students organize. Then this is a bit of the reflective piece, but then they start to look at the structure, the relational structure, the hierarchical structure of their work product and figure out how does it all fit together? So in the first stage in planning, we start to build up those representations. And then in the second stage, we, we start to build up content and we have five or six YouTube clips. And hypothetically, we have two or three audio clips and we have 10 images and we have six or seven textual pieces. And we're gonna add all of these to a website that we're, we're building as a group. Now we need to start to really organize it. Now that we have some content and we have the roadmap, they need to start to manipulate this structure, the relational structure or the work product and figure out, does that really fit into the overall end result that we're looking for? Now we go into the composition piece. Students start building this. Students start weaving these elements in together. And what we're looking to do is we're looking to, to bring, uh, bring about some cohesion to all this. We want to make sure that this is all representative of the goals of the inquiry process. But now we're in the process of we, we have all the parts that we, we thought we needed. We might have added some more digital content pieces. We organized it. We laid it all out. We started to build pieces. Now we're trying to bring unity across the entire site, unity across all of the areas. So now we're starting to really think about composing and weaving and that, that cohesive composition. Um, and there is a certain amount of voice and student voice involved in this. And there is a certain amount. Uh, one of the other pieces that's a part of this is the, the, the struggle that occurs between the role of the individual and the collaborative elements of the group. Uh, and all of these start to really show their, their head, that rear their ugly head in the composition piece. And that's another talk for another day. Then we want to take a look at revising. Uh, there is an element of this where we are revising over time. There is a piece of this where students are thinking critically and they're reflecting. We talked earlier in cognitive apprenticeship about students revising and thinking about the process and thinking about what they added. But the revision piece, now they're taking a look at the end result or what they believe to be the end result at that point. And they're systematically reviewing and examining product. They're systematically looking through what they've built and making decisions as a group to figure out, okay, what did we ultimately do? What did we ultimately say here? Can we improve upon this? Is there a way that we can improve upon what we're doing? And if so, what would it be? Usually what I will do is as the teacher, I will go online and I will find another example of work product that would mirror or mimic what they are trying to build. So for example, if I had students creating a website about a hypothetical, 
summer camp for girls and boys that were gamers. What I would do is I'd go online and find a website for a summer camp that basically was focused on boys and girls and looked to be built at the same skill level that these students would be able to build. And then I'd show it to the group and they would take a look across their site and the other site to see if there's any elements they want to revise. So this is a systematic review and examination of the work product to see what they could do better. Once again, we're focusing on student learning objectives. There are tools that we can use, but we're not really that interested in the tool. It is the tool and the pedagogical affordances of that tool. So Google Sites is a great way to, to build online websites. Students can collaboratively construct this. Uh, back in the day, I would have HTML editors or iWeb, and it was a challenge to work across sites. Now with Google Sites, students, not really in real time, but for the most part, they can work together and collaborate. Uh, Blogger or EduBlogs is a great way to have a, a student reflective tool. So students as a group can collect their thinking and learning over time, or we can use Blogger as a way for the group to capture their learning along the way. So capture their thought process and reflect on their thought process as a group over time. So that you can go back as a teacher and say, okay, back at your third meeting, you said you wanted to incorporate more videos. Why did you say that? And where are the videos? I'm looking at the end result and you don't have what you said you wanted to have. SoundCloud, uh, voice comments and Twisted Wave is a way for students to create think alouds or record audio think alouds of these decisions so they can real quickly turn on the audio recording tool and record uh, an aspect or a reflective piece about their tool, about their product to inform revisions. SoundCloud and some of these tools also can be used uh, to create those audio elements or podcasts for uh, a website or digital content. And finally, Jing, Screencast-O-Matic, uh, screen capture and screencast tools are a way to create images or videos of what's happening on their screen. They can be part of the content that they're creating or remixing. It can also be a way to capture think alouds. So once again, why is this important? The truth of the matter is that a lot of our students, as we framed all of this work, they are using online and offline or traditional print literacy resources. But a lot of this education, a lot of this thinking and this work is all stuff that they've figured out for the most part on their own. As students, you know, and we know through research that they are creating and sharing online content now as we speak, if we start to slowly bring this into our classroom, we can provide opportunities to use it in an academic sense and try and ratchet up the level of academic and intellectual rigor in what they're creating. And it's a way to create a connection between these traditional online and traditional, uh, between these online and offline literacy practices in our classroom. Online content construction is also a way for us to bring more of these out of school skills into teaching and learning. We talked earlier about how this is something that they'll need to use later on in their careers and they also this is something that they need in their, in their school careers now. A lot of our schools are going to Google Docs and blogging and content construction so we can bring more of these elements in. But also we know that our students are, as I said, sharing and creating online content if they're doing this on their own and they're doing this strictly to be creative or for the love of the subject matter, why not try and bring that into what happens in our classroom? If there is a way that they are expressing themselves and expressing their identity, why not provide an opportunity to use this in our classrooms with our students? Finally, once again, we talk about empowerment. There's a lot of information online there are multiple ways that we are telling students what is truth and what they should think and what they should believe. And once we start to teach them how to create and construct and write digital text, then they can go online and be truly be a web literate individual. They can go online and read online content 
think about what people are saying on a given topic or a theme and then be part of the discussion. They can go and write a blog post, edit Wikipedia, they can go online and be part of this global conversation instead of just being a bystander. There are numerous opportunities to connect and collaborate. First of all, YouTube is the global video sharing site. A lot of our students learn already through YouTube. We should provide them with opportunities to create and publish videos on YouTube or remix videos on YouTube. Connected Learning is an opportunity and the DML Research Hub and the Digital Is website. Three opportunities to go online as the teacher and see what other teachers are doing in terms of making, creating, constructing, remixing, or mashing up digital content. There are a wealth of opportunities. There's great work out there that teachers are involved in, and it's an opportunity for teachers to go out and share and learn more and expand their own horizons and discuss this with other teachers that are currently doing it. Once again, we're looking at one of the cornerstones of the online research and media skills model. This cornerstone is online content construction. 